Okay, good. Welcome uh, to the People's Forum. Really nice to see everyone uh, out uh, tonight. Um, my name is Jordan Camp. I'm Director of Research here and a visiting scholar in the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the CUNY Graduate Center. And I'm really happy to be hosting uh, a talk by Andrew Zimmerman on this amazing volume, which I should have just uh, had with me. Uh, that he is edited and introduced by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, The Civil War in the United States, which is published by international uh, publishers. And I think Gary Bono here in International Publishers has a table. I really want to encourage you to purchase a copy of this book. Um, it's, and if I could ask the people talking back there if they could hold it down a little bit. <laughs> Is there any chance the people out there could hold it down a little? Okay. So, but please buy a copy and then I'm sure that uh, Andrew would be happy to sign one um, after. It's a beautiful um, volume. I want to also really thank all the TPF workers who make all these events uh, happen. So I wonder if you could just join me and you know, give them a round of applause. <laughs> We have an amazing uh, team here, so um, my hat's off to, to all of you. Um, I really um, can't say enough about how excited I think all my colleagues are about holding uh, this book talk tonight because of the political importance of this text. So I hope you'll just allow me a few moments to situate this text before I introduce Professor Zimmerman and, and hand the mic to him. It was first published by a Brooklyn College professor, Dr. Herbert Moraes, in 36, by international publishers, which he did so, as um, Andrew does in a beautiful uh, introduction, which he explains under the pseudonym of Richard Inmail. Even so, the publication was one of the factors that led him to be fired from Brooklyn College and blacklisted and driven uh, from the university. And I have a lot of respect for Andrew's work in bringing this important text back in this urgent moment, as well as his principled choice to dedicate the book to Moraes. It's a beautiful um, and important act of solidarity with Moraes, but also with the other Marxist scholars, I think, in, that have been blacklisted, excluded from the university and from these circuits of knowledge production due to the forces of reaction and repression. So this solidarity that I think Andrew models for us is urgent for confronting bourgeois history, which is maintained by direct actions by university administrators and faculty to remove those who step out of line, or even more insidiously today through university appointments, tenure reviews, and the everyday and routine denial of academic freedom to the contingent faculty who overwhelmingly uh, teach in the university today. It's what, 70% by my last count. It's important to remember this context when reading Marx's writings on the C American Civil War as a revolutionary event. After all, he was also a scholar with a PhD who labored without a university appointment. When he completed his PhD in 1841, he certainly hoped for an academic appointment, but he was deemed far too radical for the profession. It was in this context that he turned to journalism to make a living, which we'll hear more about tonight, to intervene in political debates of considerable urgency, and to elevate the perspect perspectives of radical political and socialist movements of his time. In this way, Marx gave us a model for the engaged intellectual. As the Civil War in the United States, this beautiful volume powerfully shows, he used this work not simply to interpret the relationship between slavery and capitalism, but to contribute to revolutionary political and ideological struggles to end them. And in doing so, he and Engels offered a model for engaged intellectual work. That is what drove them to look for the roots of misery in the political economy. The rejection of the academy led them to search for new ways of showing the, uh, this misery and poverty and miseration was not inevitable, to show the world that it could be altered, that it could be abolished. In doing so, they demonstrated uh, the, the role of intellectuals that can be modeled in our own time. Marx and Engels 
We're part of an internationalist, revolutionary, exile community who, as Andrew teaches us again in this wonderful introduction to the volume, were fleeing political persecution, and many were in the U.S. and joined the revolutionary struggle to abolish slavery. And in fact, he shows us that this is 25% of the foreign-born uh, members of the Union Army. And it was in this context that Marx played close attention in his journalism, as well as in his historical and theoretical work to the American Civil War as a revolutionary working class struggle. After all, as W.B. Du Bois puts it in the article on Marx, included in, the, in this volume, quote, Marx stood with the abolitionist democracy led by Sumner and Stevens, end quote. This was the abolition democracy that Du Bois said was the most important revolution before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 that the world had ever seen. Black workers had won their own freedom through a general strike in the fields and created a multiracial alliance with poor whites that led to the formation of Reconstruction governments. Their efforts to build abolition democracy, Du Bois argued in the 30s, <clears throat> created <clears throat> a model for confronting capitalism and an imperialism a view that was also excluded from the academy for decades. But as Andrew teaches us, the views of Moraes, Marx, Engels, and Du Bois treated so hostily and vilified throughout the repression of this, their era have become the cornerstone for contemporary scholarship on the Civil War and Reconstruction, and we might add the history of capitalism. Their labors and visions of revolutionary working class transformation are brought to us through the labor of love and scholarship uh, that I think this work demonstrates of Andrew Zimmerman in this volume, and they continue to provide a model for confronting racism, capitalism, and the imperialism of our time. For these reasons, I'm honored and delighted to introduce this evening's speaker, Professor Andrew Zimmerman. He's professor of history at George Washington University, author of Alabama and Africa, Booker T. Washington, The German Empire, and the Globalization of the New South, Anthropology and Anti-Humanism in Imperial Germany. His work appears in influential venues such as History of the Present, Journal of the Civil War Era, American Historical Review, among many others, as well as edited volumes including Reconstruction, Sociology and Empire, as well as others too numerous to list. He is currently completing a book, A Very Dangerous Element, on the Civil War as Transnational Working Class Revolution. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Zimmerman. Thank you so much. That was such a nice introduction. I really appreciated it. felt very heard about the relationship with Moray. I, I really felt that way, too. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm really excited to talk with you about, about my, my book, Civil War in the United States. I'm going to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes and then, um, and then look forward to a, to a discussion. Um, so first, a little more about Marx and Engels and Herbert Moray and me. Um, Marx and Engels never wrote a book on the Civil War. They saw the overthrow of slavery in the United States as a major event in the transatlantic revolution um, and wrote a lot about it, but their writings were never um, in a book form or even in a big article form. There, were, there was a lot of correspondence, mostly between Marx and Engels, but also between Marx and Engels and exiles living in the, in, the, um, in the United States. A lot of newspaper articles written by Marx, some for the New York Tribune. Marx wrote a lot for the newspaper, the New York Tribune, but they didn't want to hear what he had to say about the Civil War because he was in Britain and they were in the United States. But a lot for a Viennese newspaper called uh, Die Presse. Um, and it was made into a book um, first by editors and published by international publishers, which is the press of the Communist Party of the United States. It was first published in 1937, um, and then I did a new edition in 2016. And let me talk a little bit about the, the 1937 edition. Um, so it was done, it was, it, was, it was published first by Herbert Moray, who's a professor at Brooklyn College, but he published it under the pseudonym, um, as, as Jordan said, of Richard and Male. And I showed how he derived it up there. It's, Engels plus Marx plus Lenin makes and Male. So that was, he was trying to, you know, I think he was trying to like, he didn't want to publish under his own name, but he wasn't going to just like deny his identity so much that he wasn't going to do something cool like that. But it still didn't work. And he was, um, 
he and a bunch of other Brooklyn College professors were fired for being communists in 1941 in a New York State Red Scare. And there's the New York Times headline, um, witnesses say teachers plan to depict Franklin Lincoln as forerunners of, of Reds. Um, and that's indeed one of, the, one of the points of the original edition of the book. This was the period of the popular front strategy in the, of the international communism. It was a time when the communist international, the Comintern, uh, concluded that fascism was such a threat that it was time to put aside differences not only with others on the left, but also with, um, with some bourgeois liberals, or at least with bourgeois liberalism generally, in order to fight, to concentrate in a fight against, against fascism. Uh, and the political and cultural side of this was supporting, was telling communists to support, you know, at least for the time being, uh, bourgeois states, bourgeois nations. And one of the ways this played itself out in the United States was, a, was the slogan, communism is 20th century Americanism. And I put up a, a, a pamphlet there, 20th century Americanism. Um, and one, of the, one aspect of this was portraying the Civil War as a progressive bourgeois revolution in which slavery was pre-capitalist in which Lincoln appeared as a progressive hero. And you can see, this is not related to the volume directly, but there's a, a communist rally from 1938 with, there's small pictures you probably can't see of Stalin and, and Lenin on the stage, but then a very big picture of Abraham Lincoln in the, in the middle. And then even more famously uh, was, of course, the, 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 the body of soldiers that the Communist Party of the United States organized to fight against fascism in the Spanish Civil War was called the Lincoln Brigade, and you can see a, a poster for it, um, the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. Um, and it was really, this is a really important moment, and I think that what Moray was doing in re-narrating re history was, was re-narrating history for the popular front moment. And it's important to remember also that he was going against an academic consensus that saw the Civil War as an unfortunate conflict, didn't see black freedom as necessarily desirable, um, and was frankly an openly, openly racist. So this was a very, this was a, a big shift in Civil War, it would have been a big shift in Civil War scholarship had it not been, had it not been suppressed. It came out two years after Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about its relation to Black Reconstruction um, later, in that, later, later this evening. Um, when I did the edition, one of the things I concluded is, and this is, this is part of this, this kind of maybe a, an ethics or a practice of thinking about reading other people's readings, how we engage with fellow leftist scholars. Um, I don't think that this popular front interpretation as a strategy against fascism, you know, that's, that's, a separate, that's a separate question, or maybe it's not a separate question, but it's not one I'm, but I'm just thinking just in terms of understanding Marx's views of the Civil War and what the Civil War was, that is, as a bourgeois revolution, and, and understanding the Civil War as a bourgeois revolution and understanding Marx's understanding of the Civil War as a bourgeois revolution, I don't think is right. I think we get a better understanding of the Civil War if we look at it more like Du Bois looked at it, which is as a working class revolution. And I think that's actually, Marx had the beginning of that interpretation too, and so I wanted to, in a sense, restore what I think of as a more correct interpretation of Marx and of the Civil War, um, and of and, and and make a, a, a you know in in some ways implicitly a um, a point about potential communist strategy. This is also through international publishers. I should say this is not representing a line of the Communist Party of the United States. It just represents my own my own personal view um, of the of the situation. Um, what I did, like, but like Moray's version, is this is very much written for a particular moment, and the particular moment being the present. I did, and there's new documents, there's some doc, I, I excluded some documents that Moray included that I thought were repetitive. I included other documents, I used updated translations, and I translated a few documents um, my, myself that, 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 hadn't, that had only been in, in German before. Um, and again, to recover Marx's interpretation of the Civil War as a working class revolution against capitalist planters, uh, like Du Bois in Black Reconstruction. Now, one of the things I think we dis I discovered in, in, in presenting these, and I think that this, this, this edition shows, I think where Moray's edition showed a kind of, presented a, comp a kind of 
complete interpretation. What I wanted to preserve was the, the real-time nature of, of what was happening. Marx and Engels were watching the Civil War unfold. The Civil War itself was developing from a fairly conservative war to preserve the Union from the side of the Union to a revolutionary war to overthrow slavery or a revolution to overthrow slavery. So the war was changing. Marx and Engels were learning um, about the war and about their own ideas. And so I wanted to preserve this notion of, like, of, a, of a developing Marxism in dialogue with the developing revolution against, against slavery in, in the United States. Um, I also uh, want to recover, therefore, a Marxism that is, maybe what I would say is recover a communism of which Mar Marx's various views are part, but to have to see it as a broader dialogue and as a developing dialogue, of which Marx is an extremely important participant, but not the center um, necessarily. There, isn't, there is no center necessarily. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the international, let's get to the Civil War itself, the international revolution and the Civil War. Marx and Engels knew and cared about the Civil War in the United States because their internet, they were part of an international revolutionary community that participated in it. Um, Marx and Engels were living in Britain um, for most of their life as part of a big exile community of communists who'd taken part in revolutions across Europe in, 1840, in 1848 to 1849. The revolutions themselves were very diverse and had all, you know, they had bourgeois participants, communist participants, all kinds of participants. But communists played a key role, especially in the western part of Germany. And when the revolution failed, they all went into exile because they were not going to get pardons from the state for their role because they were the most radical. Um, and so they had to go into exile. And Many of them stayed in London. They wanted to stay in London, but many could not afford to stay in London, and they had to go to the United States. They didn't go to the United States because they thought, this is the land of liberty, we want to see liberty, although it's often presented that way. But they said, the United States has cheap rent, European police don't arrest us there, and we can, we can work there. And that was it. They, did, they were not impressed by the United States as a beacon of democracy um, because of slavery, because of racism, and because of anti-alcohol laws, two were the three things they cited a lot. Um, and uh, the, um, so it's important to remember, first of all, that they go to the United States not with communist answers to the problem, which I think, but much more important with communist questions. And I think that's, that's a lesson for communists in any struggle, is to raise communist questions, not to, you know, not to, I mean, and obviously not to come in with some, they don't come with some dogma about anything, but just they, they come in with communist questions. Um, as you'd expect, uh, they get involved in U.S. politics, and the big issue in U.S. politics in the 1850s was the question of slavery. They're anti-slavery, like a lot of people, um, but they're anti-slavery in a different way from most white anti-slavery groups. Uh, they believed in overthrowing slavery no matter what the Constitution said, no matter what the laws said. The Constitution was pretty clear as in supporting slavery, that was how the Supreme Court interpreted it. The laws of the United States were pretty clear in supporting slavery, not just local state laws, but, but, the, but the laws of the United States as a whole, even in states where slavery um, w was not allowed. And whereas the Republican Party, for example, and the ancestor parties to that party were very concerned about how can we end slavery without breaking the law, um, communists were not concerned about breaking the law. In fact, probably they thought breaking the law was, you know, an added bonus rather than something that would, 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 um, would, would hold them back. Um, they believed in working closely with enslaved people and with black anti-slavery ad advocate activists, um, exactly as they would work with any working class group. Self-emancipation is, of course, key to the struggle against slavery. And it's also, I think, if you said to say, like, what's like the, 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 the absolute reduction of communism, what does it have to be? And self-emancipation, I think, would be the key, the, the, maybe the key, the key term. And so they were also unlike um, white radical abolitionists who had a more paternalistic attitude towards um, enslaved people and, and African Americans uh, more broadly. And we see already in the 1850s multiracial radical scenes developing in places like Hoboken, New Jersey, just across the river, St. Louis, Missouri, and Cincinnati, and many other places as well. When the Civil War broke out, um, 
that many of these, these communist radicals, these communist exiles, uh, went into the Union Army. A lot of them had military experience from the 1848 revolutions. Um, as Jordan mentioned, one in four Union soldiers had been born overseas. One in 10 had been born in, in Germany. Um, and communists were just a small percentage of that, of that large group, but they played a key role in radicalizing the war and in changing the war. Uh, there were very important communist generals, um, two of them that I talk about it, portrayed up there, August Willich and, and Franz Siegel, but there were, there were many others. There were many others also. And as I said, they were very important in pushing Lincoln and the Union Army to the left, but even more, and in, they're, the, they're, they're the most important interface between what Du Bois calls the general strike and the Union Army. Um, the Union Army had a variety of relations to enslaved people rebelling against slavery, um, and the German one was, was not the only most radical version, but the most radical version, which, you know, and, and the gesture there is not saying anything or doing anything, but handing one of your guns to a enslaved person and fighting alongside them when it was illegal. This is not about inducing, inducting people into the army at all, but we actually, even from the beginning, fighting in arms against, against slavery. Um, interestingly, and this is something I didn't know when I edited this book, but I've been working on it since, most of these communists were to the left of Karl Marx in the Communist League. If you know if anybody here is a aficionado of the, uh, the debates in the, um, in the 1850s, there's a, something that gets called the Willick Shopper Faction, and Willick is that person on the left. And it's not really, a, it's, the, it's the large, it's the majority position in the Communist League, which basically, I'm sim oversimplifying somewhat, but it's basically capitalism's terrible. As soon as we have the possibility of overthrowing it by force of arms, let's do it. And Marx, in this period, had a more gradualist um, view that we had to wait until capitalism fully develops and, um, and, then, uh, and, then, and, then, and then and only then fight for socialism. Um, the civil, these would have been called ultra leftists in the terminology of, in, in, of contemporary Marxism. And the Civil War brought Marx and Engels more in line with these ultra leftists, in part by showing Marx and Engels a revolution that worked, transforming their ideas about revolution and about politics. So through analyzing the war, they not only give us a really, Marx and Engels, um, not only give us a really important analysis of a really important event, but they also um, discover a model of revolution that changes their own political understandings of revolution. It's a revolution that occurs inside of a war. It's a revolution that occurs inside of a bourgeois republic. Um, it's a, you know, and where else would a, a revolution, a proletarian revolution occur, I guess? Um, they um, see it as a, they, they take it as an inspiration for renewing their political efforts. If their politics in the 1850s were just saying mean things to other, to, to, you know, to other communists and just being, it's, you know, it's, it's, it was a terrible demoralizing exile. Um, after, by the end of the Civil War, they were both actively engaged in new kinds of politics. One is the founding of the First International in 1864, which you know, at the end of the Civil War, that makes Marx and the other members of the First International make repeated reference to the Civil War as this great inspiring event. In the year, the first annual celebration of the First International, the big flag at the center, you'd think it would be like a red flag, but they have the, the U.S. flag at the big, it's probably the only communist meeting where there was a big U.S. flag display, but they said, hey, they just made a revolution. They just overthrew this oppressive form of private property. Um, and, um, and so that was, that, was the, that was an inspiration. Also, Capital Volume One, Marx had been you know, working on it for a very long time, and he finally published it. The Civil War kind of gave him the final push to publish it. The first edition came out in 1867 and makes repeated references to the Civil War as its condition of, 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 of appearance. Um, just one from the preface that I want to read. As, the 18th century, as in the 18th century, the American War of Independence sounded the alarm bell for the European middle class, so in the 19th century, the American Civil War sounded it for the European working class. Um, and there are other references, too, even in the preface to the, to the Civil War. So what did Marx think about slavery, capitalism, and revolution? Um, Marx and Engels. The, Marx, contrary to a lot of academic Marxists today did not see slavery as a pre-capitalist or feudal mode of production. Of course, Marx and Engels knew that there'd been slavery in many societies, including non-capitalist societies, and they didn't think it was capitalist in, you know, they didn't think ancient Roman slavery was capitalist slavery, but they said this enslavement of 
African people in the um, in the Americas was a, was was part of capitalism was a central part of capitalism. Um, like many in the labor movement, uh, for Marx and Engels, slavery provided an analogy for understanding wage labor. They often compared the domination of the rich people over wage earners to the domination of slaveholders over enslaved people. And this could have a lot of resonances in the labor movement. It could, at one end, um, lead to minimizing the horrors of slavery um, or even apologizing for slavery. But at the other end, at the left end, both in the United States and, and for Marx and Engels, it could lead to great solidarity to wage earners admiring and learning from um, enslaved, the uprisings and the politics of enslaved people. And Marx made it clear that when he talks about the enslavement of people of African descent, that it's unique and central to capitalism, that it's not just an analogy, it's not just an analogy for, for, for wage work, it's not just an input to real capitalism, but it is a real part of capitalism. And we see this already in 1847 in a, in a book called The Pover Poverty of Philosophy. And he says, slavery is an economic category like any other. Needless to say, we are dealing only with direct slavery, with Negro slavery in Suriname and Brazil in the southern states of North America. Direct slavery is just as much the pivot of bourgeois industry as machinery, credits, etc. Um, and I think that's important to remember, just because I think that's, I think these kind of debates about whether slavery was pre-capitalist or capitalist, I think are, are distra I don't think they're that important, um, but they become kind of this Marxological feature that I think is not central to a communist analysis of capitalism. Um, even before the Civil War, Marx recognized that unfree workers in the periphery, especially enslaved people, were a kind of vanguard. It's not just that they're part of capitalism or exploited by capitalism, but that their struggles are a vanguard in the struggle against capitalism. This is from a letter Marx wrote to Engels in January of 1860, which sounds like it's easy just to say, on the eve of the Civil War, but Lincoln hadn't even been nominated for president yet, much less elected. There was no Civil War yet. So this is really not on the eve, just, this is just 1860. And Marx says, in my view, the most momentous thing happening in the world today is the slave movement. On the one hand, in America, started by the death of John Brown, and in Russia, on the other. He's talking about the movement against serfdom in Russia, and so comparing two forms of unfree agricultural labor as um, the most momentous things happening in the world today. Sometimes, I think in some ways, his focus, well, we'll talk more about the focus on John Brown um, later, on the focus on, on white revolutionaries later, which is, which is it was something that um, Marx, sometimes, Marx often did. But then he says, it concludes in that letter, I've just seen in the Tribune that there's been another slave revolt in Missouri, which was put down, needless to say, but the signal has now been given. He's not just talking about white fighters against slavery like John Brown, but he's talking about uprisings of, of enslaved people in, in the Americas, as well as secondarily in, in, in Russia. Um, so let me talk now about, so when the Civil War breaks out, Marx and Engels, I mean, it's, they're already primed to see it as part of a revolution against slavery. And one of the points I make in the book is just, is just that, that it's a much, that the, the Civil War is not a discrete event, but there's a long revolution against capitalism. And in the period of 1860, and I don't know how much later, but after, um, unfree agricultural labor is already at a van, as, as, is at a vanguard. It's not, you know, it's not the, the most advanced sectors of the working class being, you know, kind of a labor aristocracy or anything like that. That's not, that's not their position. So, Marx and Engels on the Civil War itself. One of the remarkable things about Marx and Engels' writings on the Civil War is that they understood a lot of things about the Civil War before the Union leadership understood those things about the Civil War. And, you know, who knows why? It's impossible to know why. But I think one reason, I think, is that because they started with thinking about questions about working class revolution and revolutions of enslaved people and then ask, how does the war fit into that? Not how does that fit into the war? How does the end? That, I think, is maybe why. But in any case, it's remarkable how much they got about the war before Lincoln did. And indeed, how much they got about the war before mainstream um, white historian, academic historians got it in um, anywhere. So um, 
Marx recognized, first of all, before Lincoln and before the official Union, um, Union war aims accepted, that the Civil War was a war against slavery. Now, it's very important for me to, just to, to emphasize one point, is that the Confederacy started the war to preserve and expand slavery. That's 100% clear, and all, this, all the statements that it was, there's anything ambiguous about that, come after the war, when sort of like Holocaust deniers after the Holocaust, it's just, it's a, it's a way to of, of a lose of a lot of a, of a people who've lost to try to justify themselves. Um, st it's very clear from their, their, everything they say that it's about, not, well, not only about slavery, but also about white supremacy, both slavery and white supremacy. And if you look at the, the common argument that it's about, that was about states' rights, one easy way to, to disprove that is just to look at the Confederate Constitution, which is, online in a lot of places and look at where what they say about states' rights and they, what they say about is nothing. They take away the rights of states to abolish slavery in their own borders and they make clear um, in their language that the bond between the states in the Confederacy is stronger even than the bond between the states in the, um, in the United States Constitution. So that's pretty easy to demolish. And I only emphasize that because that's such an important part of neo-Confederate talking points and I always worry that when I say that Lincoln was not Start, Lincoln was not fighting to end slavery, that people will say, think that, and I would, would somehow support this neo-Confederate argument that it wasn't about slavery. It absolutely was about slavery. Um, but Lincoln's and Union policy was to protect slavery where it already existed. Um, their strategy was to take, partly just to take away the grounds of secession. The secessionists said were, started the war because they said Lincoln is trying to end slavery and Lincoln was once trying to prove that indeed he was not trying to end slavery. But it's also important to remember that Lincoln was a moderate on slavery. He was the, he was not the, um, in the, in the 19, 1860 Republican, um, Republican nomination, he was not the Bernie Sanders of the, uh, of the nominee at all. He was, he was, he was elected as, a, as an electable electable cent centrist, electric, mod moderate on the slavery question. And many generals, and top generals, union generals, were even more, um, were, pro were even more pro-slavery. And none of them were um, an anti-racist or you know, radically anti-slavery. Um, and that's the way they fought the war in the East Coast, in the, in the, in the Eastern theater. But in, in the state of Missouri, um, a different kind of war began, a revolutionary war began against slavery. And that's what Marx and Engels were interested in, partly because that's where the revolution was, but also because a lot of their exiled comrades were living in Missouri. Four-fifths of the Union troops that fought, the, of the troops that fought in Missouri for the Union at first were, um, were German-born. And they were commanded by communists, including um, Franz Siegel, who yeah, is pictured is pictured there, and they um, and they were their top commander was someone named John C. Fremont, who was not uh, German himself, but was worked very closely with German and other exiled European radicals. And from the beginning in Missouri, um, these German radicals uh, emancipated enslaved people, giving them guns, um, totally against the Lincoln. Lincoln, um, Lincoln's policy, and their top commander, Fremont, didn't initiate this policy at all, but gave them kind of legal cover by issuing a general order saying, that's basically, it was like the Emancipation Proclamation, but two years earlier, and only for Missouri, just saying, um, all people held as slaves by, by secessionists are hereby declared forever free. And Lincoln uh, countermanded. He said, this is, this is not a war about abolition. This is not a war to end slavery. And so Lincoln undid the, undid the, um, the order and, uh, and, and dismissed Fremont from his command in, in Missouri. And um, this didn't stop the radicals. They kept doing it anyway. They, they, they were not dependent on Fremont. But Fremont's, um, the, the, uh, Lincoln's deposing of Fremont from command galvanized what had been kind of a, a, a local Missouri left into a national opposition to, um, to Lincoln for his conservative uh, position on, um, on slavery. And Marx wrote in an, in an article um, for the Austrian press, should the Union government meet with a few more mishaps like those of Bull Run and Ball's Bluff, those are battles that did not, the war did not go well for the Union until the very end of the war. Um, it has given itself the opposition, it's, it's given it 
itself, it has itself given the opposition its leader in John Fremont. And sure enough, in 1864, in the presidential election, Fremont ran against Lincoln from the left and dropped out at the end, lest he uh, make Lincoln lose the election. Um, so in the beginning, it's not, the war does not going well for the Union, and it's not going well for the left. And Marx decided that he remained optimistic. He said the Union could not win the war without a revolution against slavery. Therefore, it's just a matter of time until the Union starts making a revolution against slavery. This is what Marx wrote. In the long run, of course, the North will be victorious since, if the need arises, it has a last card up its sleeve in the shape of a slave revolution. And um, Engels, however, was much more pessimistic. Engels wrote to Marx, what makes me lose confidence in any success where the Yankees are concerned isn't so much the military situation as such. Where, amongst the people, is there any sign of revolutionary vigor? And by revolutionary vigor, vigor he means um, arming African Americans and fighting against slavery, exactly what was already happening in Missouri, but contrary to Union, union policy. Um, Marx wrote to Engels, um, it strikes me that you allow yourself to be influenced by the military aspect of things a little too much. And Engels remained pessimistic because he was focused very much on the military details of the war. But one thing that's really interesting about Engels is that his military interests led him to kind of propose a strategy for the Union winning the war that actually became the strategy by which the Union won the war. He said in 1862 that it just doesn't matter that, I mean, it matters a little bit, but that right now the war is focused on taking the, uh, the Union war is focused on taking the Confederate capital at Rich, in, in Richmond, Virginia. And Marx said, that's actually, or Engels said, that's not really what's important. What's really important is taking the railroad junctions in, uh, in Tennessee and in Georgia and kind of undermining um, the Confederacy through its economy, through its railroads, um, and, so, and socially rather than just focusing on the capital. And that indeed is what ended up happening under Grant and, and Sherman at the end of the war. That's in fact how they, how they won the war. And so again, I think it's just interesting that they were able to predict a lot about it. And I think, again, because their, their kind of analysis was informed by a, you know, it was a radical left minority within the Union cause, but that understood the war possibly more accurately, but in any case, a different way from the mainstream. Marx eventually comes around to liking Lincoln and sees him as a kind of revolutionary that he always thought he would become. Um, I won't read that, that long quote, but he says basically Lincoln's become a new kind of revolutionary. Um, he's a new kind of hero that could not have been, that couldn't have been possible in Europe before. This is not what German communists or the left in the United States was saying about Lincoln. They were furious at Lincoln all the way through for not being hard enough against slavery, for always taking a step backwards when he didn't, see, he didn't even need to take a step backwards, even after Lincoln became, the, uh, the Union became officially um, anti-slavery. Anti um, but as I said, the Civil War also inspired Marx to get back into politics, um, to throw himself into the, into the founding of the First International, and to finish the first volume of Capital. Now I want to look at um, something that Marx and Engels didn't get, because I think it's not just about, it's never, it's not to criticize them particularly, but I think one way to read left thinkers always as a leftist is to say, what did they get right, but also, you know, what are the potentials for further development? And one of the potentials for further development is Finding the Black Worker, from Karl Marx to W.E.B. Du Bois. So Marx ta Marx talked about the possibility of a slave uprising and called the Civil War working class revolution, but it's not clear which workers he meant when he was talking about workers. Certainly in Marx's own terms, going back to that poverty of philosophy and to his letter about, in 1860 about the, um, about slave uprisings being some of the most interesting things happening in the world today, he could, in his own terms, have seen enslaved African Americans as the most exploited in their, and also the most militant workers in the United States, possibly in the world, a kind of revolutionary vanguard. Um, Marx did see working class agency in the Civil War, but he often attributed it especially to Abraham Lincoln as a true son of the working class. Lincoln was actually a railroad lawyer by the time he became president, um, and not, I mean, so whatever he had, and so, but Marx, and, and, and 
it's interesting. It's, so Mark sees working class agency, but then it's almost like he misses where the working class agency is. And when W.E.B. Du Bois read Marx's writings on the Civil War, um, you know, he found it very useful, but he had, I think, a kind way of saying, um, you know, what he could have said, one might, one might say less kindly. Um, whatever Marx said and did concerning the uplift of the working class must, therefore, be modified, so far as Negroes are concerned, by the fact that he had not studied at first hand their peculiar race problem here in America. And that's in 1933, and two, year, two years later he would publish um, Black, Re Black Reconstruction. Um, in Black Reconstruction, Du Bois puts the African American enslaved working class at the center of his story. He talks about the general, a, a general strike of black workers leading to emancipation that forces the union to accept emancipation. He points out that a counter-revolution of property undid this proletarian revolution. So it was, it was for Du Bois, it was, it was, it was you know, as Jordan pointed out, the most interesting communist revolution before the October Revolution, then undone by a counter-revolution after the Civil War. Um, This was not discussed in the first edition, of course, of Marx and Engels on the Civil War, um, although Du Bois did discuss Du Bois and Black Reconstruction elsewhere. But Moray, like most communists at the time, including Trotskyists, including C.L.R. James, um, said this is a really important book about African-American agency in the Civil War, but we don't believe it was a proletarian revolution. But I think that's what Marx thought, and I think Du Bois is right about that, and I, you know, we can judge for, for ourselves. Um, but I think the main thing just to emphasize here is that communism is a tradition that develops through criticism and self-criticism. And it's what we see here in Marx and in Engels and Du Bois's criticism. Um, and I think one thing, well, I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, I'm continuing to write about the Civil War too, and I just wanted to mention how I'm trying to develop Du Bois's development of Marx and Engels. Um, the scholar uh, Saidiya Hartman has criticized Du Bois for using the term general strike. Um, it's a term from the European labor movement, and she says that it misses a lot of the African-American experience of enslavement, and she's focusing particularly on the experience of enslaved women. Um, and one of the things that, and I think that's a, that's, that's a good point, I think that's the language that Du Bois used, but it's not, necessar it's not the language that African-Americans um, making this, the general strike themselves used. I came across an interview done by, it was these interviews that were done in the 1930s by the Works Progress Administration of, of formerly enslaved people with a woman named Lucy Broadest. And, Broadest, and she's, this is 1935, so the same year the Black Reconstruction is published. And she also publishes a kind of self-emancipation thesis. Um, she's talking, and she says that it was not Lincoln, it was not the Union, it was conjurers, practitioners of Afro-Atlantic um, a religion, a social healing tradition, the North American variant of Haitian Vodou or Brazilian Candomblé, all of, and, and other, other Afro-Atlantic religions, all of which played a role in the struggle against slavery in, in the Americas. Um, so she says, them heady persons sure could do that conjuration. It was them that freed the slaves. Heady persons were conjurers. They give a hand to Lincoln and them other big emancipator men. And I just love the phrase, Lincoln and them other big emancipator men, because it's, you know, she's, she's, she's poking fun, she's mocking, she's dismissing. Um, so that they could bring it about, a gift from the colored people of conjuration and power. And it sounds like she's, she's contradicting herself. Did they do it or did they give them a hand? But a hand, which she's referring to, is a conjure hand. It's one of the main substances in conjure. And I just have a picture of it picture of it, picture of it there. So that's how I'm trying to take the communist um, interpretation, in a sense, beyond communism and say there are multiple um, traditions, none of which are like the, the traditions of freedom supposed to inhere in the United States and its constitution and the spirit of freedom that Thomas Jefferson was supposed by some still, I think, to have, um, but rather these like un-American traditions, including communism, including conjure, including many other things too. Um, so what about after the Civil War? I think probably one of the reasons why Marx and Engels never got all their letters together and published on the Civil War 
is that it was a disappointment. Du Bois explained it as a counter-revolution of property. I think Marx and Engels would have believed, would have, would have agreed. There was a lot of hope across the left after the Civil War. Um, the whole left hoped for land redistribution of formerly enslaved people, that planter land would be divided and given to enslaved people, and it wasn't. It was given back to planters and the system of uh, sharecropping and segregation and Jim Crow and racial terrorism um, quickly went into place. Um, there was an emergence of a more militant movement among wage workers, a movement for the eight-hour day that's very important in a, a chapter in um, Marx's Capital. Um, Marx and Engels continued to hope for further worker victories in the U.S. after the Civil War, but they also didn't see any further victories, and they turned their attention to other revolutionary situations. But I think the, an important point is that they continued to see that the Civil War continued to imprint how they understood these revolutions. For them, the next big paradigm um, after the Civil War was the Paris Commune of 1871. It was the revolution in Paris. I won't, won't talk about the details now, but it's a revolution. They, 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 they and Lenin and many others saw this as a very important um, early communist revolution. And they wrote a, Marx wrote a book about it called, tellingly, The Civil War in France in which he uses the terminology of the Civil War um, explicitly to kind of frame the Paris Commune as like the Civil War. Um, and he has this wonderful phrase that I think is, I just really, I just really like it, um, and you know, for a lot of reasons, but they called the, the Paris Commune um, the fight of workers for socialism and against oppression as um, the, the war of the enslaved against their enslavers, the only justifiable war in history. And I thought that's just really a nice quote. Um, one, because it focuses on like what a violent revolution, what violence is, what political violence is, which is a war of an enslaved against the enslavers, and also the only justifiable war in history. Um, one thing I worry about, I think Marx must have worried about it too, and this, that's one of the reasons this resonates with me so much, is you know, that it's not, when writing about the Civil War, or any war that's like a good war, there's such a danger of glorifying war, and a lot of Civil War historians do this. And I think keeping that as a sort of regulatory principle um, is pretty good. You know, another way to say it is no war but the class war. Um, but that's maybe more elegant. Um, and finally, another important thing, and I won't read this, this long passage, but, um, oops. But it's um, Marx and Engels recognized in the disappointments of the post-Civil War South that racism was incredibly important for um, maintaining the oppression of the whole working class. That's something they didn't talk enough about in their writings on the Civil War. They talked a little bit about it, but not nearly enough. And afterwards, um, you know, they're not writing about, they, they actually, they, they use the U.S. as an example elsewhere in this letter. All these, these texts are in, in this book, by the way. Um, they're talking about England and Ireland, but they're saying that, um, that anti-Irish racism by the English people is not only oppressing Irish people, it's also making the English people side with their own, the English working class side with their own oppressors. And so maybe just to read the last line. Um, the special task of the Central Council of the First International is to awaken the consciousness of the English working class that for them, the national emancipation of Ireland is not a question of abstract justice or humanitarian sentiment, but the first condition of their own social emancipation. And I think it's both the anti-racism, but also an anti-racism that's done through solidarity, that it's a common struggle. It's not just, you guys really shouldn't be racism because it's racist because it's not nice. It's a, doesn't, that doesn't matter about that, it does, but it doesn't, that's not the point. It's coming up with an anti-racist struggle that's a struggle in solidarity for emancipation that makes anti-racism key, key to the struggle for, um, for, emancip for, for everybody's emancipation and works out a logic and a strategy of solidarity rather than of humanitarianism or any other kind of general, um, more you know, liberal, liberal concepts. And for me, I think that's maybe the most important lesson um, of Marx's writings on the Civil War, one that Marx only got long after the Civil War, but Du Bois got, I think was really important. Um, so I'll stop there. I'd love to hear questions or comments or, um, yeah, anything else? Thank you. I had only read a, like a small excerpt of your book before, but 
Uh, and there was one letter that Marx wrote about the Homestead Act in the United States, and he seemed to think that was a good idea, that where Lincoln and Congress signed that to give land to uh, people basically for free or close to free in the West. And what's your interpretation of, was, was that Homestead Act like a, a leftist thing, or is, was it different than that? Uh, and also, I guess Marx didn't realize the, the Native Americans were affected by that also. And then there's the Homestead Act, but then uh, after the war, there was a promise of uh, 40 acres and a mule, and that never happened, though. Uh, and why, why didn't that happen as opposed to the Homestead Act? Yeah, that's a good. That the, the second one, this, the second one, is um, is easier to answer because it's, it's of U.S. racism and a determination, I think, of the white people because the Homestead Act was for white people, and the Forty Acres and a Mule was for was for black people, and it was a determination um, there. That's another, I and mean, that's a that's another um, story that you see here, along with Marx's understanding that anti-racism is central to the struggle also a better understanding of settler colonialism. Like a lot of white male working class people in the United States in this period, um, Marx saw, Marx was really focused on white male working class people and the Homestead Act, which basically just allowed white people to, to seize um, the land of Native American people and farm it as you know, free farmers, this is called free soil, was, um, was really important. It's, interestingly, there was a farther left in the, uh, in the United States, the Working Man's Party, that opposed, they called it that pseudo-free soil, it's not, it's not really free soil. And Marx, you know, a little bit like what he realizes too late in, you know, for the Civil War, how important, anti, how, oppose, how important it is to oppose anti-black racism, he also later says, you know, the settler, the, the the settlement of the of the of the West is you know one of the great atrocities, something like one of the great atrocities. But he realizes, you know, this is like in the 1870s that he starts talking about that too. But yeah, that's one another one of Marx's Marx's um, Marx's errors. That's you know, and that's you know, in a way, there's like this idea that the the truth is in the in the in the method of Marxism rather than in the um, in the in the conclusions there. Uh, when did uh, what what can be ascribed as uh, leftist ideologies start in Europe and and also in the, uh, in America? Yeah. And um, when did the term communism come up uh, Europe and America? Yeah, that's a good good question. Um, I mean, the left. I guess technically it goes back to the the French Revolution as the first time of a 1789 was the first time there was, you know, the people on you know, the left sat on the, we would say on the left, sat on the left side of the, um, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the, of, of, of the parliament of the legislature. Um, communism and socialism could mean a lot of different things. The reason I use the term communism is for the Communist League. So it's the group for which Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. And that, they wrote the, that was in 1840, 1848. Or was it 47? They wrote the manifesto was published in 48. But anyway, late 1840s, that that group was called communist. There were other groups that called themselves communists too. So it's a little bit, it's, it's confusing and there's a lot of different names. And one of the things I did in, the, did in my, all my writing on the Civil War is sort of flatten out some of the, the, different, the different organizational organizational names. But that's what they mean by communism. And it's interesting. I mean, they, they're both, um, you know, it's a pro-working class, movement and an anti-slavery movement. And it's, it's a different kind of, you know, it's something that's to the left of mainstream politics, whether it's the Whigs before the Republicans and then the Republicans as well. Hi. Um, yeah, I came across this book uh, maybe about a year ago and, you know, read every page, loved Great. it. Um, Thank you. And one of the things about the book uh, is beyond just what their thoughts on the Civil War wa yeah. was, it gave a really interesting, almost narrative insight into Marx and Engels' relationship with each other. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I, I've been kind of rereading it all day, the uh, little dig about, uh, I'm sure no other uh, military developments will happen without you letting me know your thoughts on it. <laughs> um, and yeah. then the, another letter I couldn't find, but it was about uh, Pompey and all that about 
Mark's just being desperate for money and yeah. his wife is nagging him and he locked himself in his room and is reading about Pompeii all day and yeah. is just writing to angles about that. Yeah. Um, I was just curious if you came across anything that kind of spoke to you like that? Yeah, a lot. I'm glad that came across. That really, I mean, that's one of the things that you wouldn't have seen probably if you'd, um, if they had, you know, made their made a book on the Civil War in the United States, and they're kind of replacing all these letters with a a, a more you know united front and a, a more you know academic y sounding book or a more ac analytic sounding book. And to me, one of the things this really um, speaks to is just the importance of the exile experience, of the immigrant and exile experience for, for communism, um, for so many things, but also for communism too, that they were, um, they were really cranky. I mean, Marx was, you know, really cranky anyway, but then they were, just, they were you know, they were, they were in, impoverished, they were often sleeping in parks. Um, August Willich had to set up a uh, broom making cooperative um, in order for just a few people to make brooms just enough to get enough to, to eat. Um, the only the reason, you know, and they were, and they, um, and the experience of poverty and exile and just the miseries of that, I think, shape their politics both for better and for worse. And I think it's nice when you see Marx and Engels, are, they're always humorous with each other. They're not humorous necessarily with, with other people outside of there. But I think, you know, one of the, one thing that really stuck, struck me is, you know, Engels um, has money because he is the son of a cotton mill owner who is, um, who is earning money off of slave-grown cotton. And he knows that, um, and occasionally they refer to this, that the, the money's gonna dry up if the, you know, you may, or may dry up if the cotton supplies dry up. And that's, a, I mean, the way I interpret that you know, just generally is to think about the way everybody makes revolution from within a reactionary society, but Engels is a bit extreme. And there are a few digs that Marx makes um, against Engels, you know, sort of playfully, but saying, you know, you're a Manchester cotton, cotton lord. Um, and I mean, it's disturbing though, too, that part of it, but it's also, that, that's the thing that really stood out for me is that kind of constant subtext about, you know, you're also benefiting from this system too, and that, that, that was the part. But I'm really glad that came across. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, hey, uh, so in the in the Moray's edition, there's this really incredible uh, part in like 1862 that you alluded to, where Engels is really pessimistic. Uh, England and France are very close to to uh, recognizing the, the the secessionist government. And uh, Marx says, well, hang on, you know, you're looking too much at the military, they're, they're, it's gonna, it's gonna, there's gonna be a revolutionary turn. Yeah. And then we know that it happens, you know, September Antietam and then the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah. Um, but then there aren't a lot of letters in the Moray section after that. There's like a big jump and then there's like one or two in 1863 and then a couple more. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, if, is there a particular reason for that? Do you have more from that period in this one? Uh, is the re was there an ideological reason? Were they not translated? Did they just not? write as much about the Civil War in that period. I'm wondering where it differs from, from the Moray's book yeah. there because I got to that part, I was like, oh, I want to find out what happens next. And yeah, then, and then, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, there were a lot of, you know, I can't remember exactly the, the comparison, but part of it is just that the, um, the Marx Engels collected, where there are a bunch of editions, you know, the, the Moray was, was um, 37, so he just didn't have the kind of collected works that, um, that I had available to me. And then also my own research to the Civil War, I came, on the Civil War I came across, you know, things not by Marx, I mean, I think everything by Marx and Engels, well, I don't want to say that. I'm not going to discover anything new by Marx and Engels, but, but new things by Joseph Weidemeyer and people that, um, that Marx and Engels knew and that were important for that. Um, but a lot of it is just, you know, all this like hundreds, like lots of people doing editorial work since then. And so the stuff has been, they're, they're updated translations also that, since, since Moray, Moray did it too. But I think Moray was working with just everything that was available. And I think Moray was also focused more narrowly on just the Civil War and not on larger questions about you know, slavery and capitalism, capitalism too. But it's, yeah, every, I did everything that I could possibly find plausibly related to the Civil War, with the exception of like they wrote a million articles and letters on this thing called the Trent Affair, which was like an almost thing, something that almost happened and then didn't happen. I mean, it's not important what it, what it was, um, but um, but everything other than that, it's just I just other people mostly I found a few things, but mostly other people found more things since then. 
Here's a yeah. little section on the Trenum Fair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do have a little fair on this. Yeah, yeah. It's just they're so repetitive. I just did a few of them and then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry for no, not no, noticing please, please. protocol. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is um, a, a little far afield, but do you know, uh, do you know much about how um, the potential cotton famine in England would, was interpreted by the working class and the sort of larger communist yeah. movement, you know, given the importance yeah. of American cotton to textiles there? Yeah, they, there was the, um, it was, there was a, they called it a cotton famine, and in, in especially in Britain, but also in, in textile spinning areas of France, workers really suffered a lot, and one of the, um, one of the things that really inspired Marx to, you know, have hope in the revolution again was the fact that English workers weren't were supporting the union, even though it was costing them a lot. I mean, and you know, and and you know that they were they were going hungry because and and that their interpretation anyway was that the only reason that the English government didn't recognize the Confederacy was because they would have had a working class uprising on their hands, and you know that's a that's a you know, a counterfactual. It seems plausible to me, but but certainly workers demonstrated in favor of the of the union and supported the union even when they were, you know, suffering from the Civil War and would have benefited very much if Britain because if Britain had recognized the Confederacy, they could have just been begun just restarted the fact that you know the, the cotton the cotton mills again, and they um, they didn't do that, and that was like right on working class. <laughs> so so we've got time for maybe one two more questions. Hi, I'm just. Curious about yeah. what is the relationship that the communist exiles had with the abolitionist, the abolitionist anti-slavery society, and what were the influence that they had on each other? Yeah, that's a good question. They had very different um, strategies. The you know they liked. I mean, John Brown. They liked. They liked the um, the the political anti-slavery people. Um, they were in Hoboken. Frederick Douglass was part of that scene. So. But white abolitionists like Garrison, um, his resistance to politics and violence, and his, um, you know, he he um, denounced the Nat Turner uprising, um, and that was like so so different from their strategy, and the way they expressed that was, you know, they said they just they just have like pious sayings, but that's that's all they did. Like, I mean, if you Wendell Phillips was someone they did like, who was a much more pro labor. Um, as well as anti-slavery, so they, they 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 often I think there's some quotes, some letters that, or I think Marx republished some Wendell Phillips here. I can't remember exactly, but definitely Wendell Phillips was quoted in the communist press. But um, the uh, in the in the United States, but um, but Garrison not so much, you know, not so much. There was a, it was a difference in um, in uh, in strategy. One thing they did have in common, if I was trying to get them to like each other and talk to each other, is that they both believed that. The Constitution was not a document of emancipation, and that emancipation couldn't be, you know, it was involved a break with U.S. traditions rather than an embrace of U.S. traditions. So that's something they could have shared, and they might have had a discussion there, but they, as far as I know, they didn't. Okay, uh, two questions. Uh, from the point of view of history as a discipline, mm -hmm. uh, what would you say is the most Important contribution of Mars to to history as a, uh, also uh, um, my another question is uh, um, so, I'm sorry, Alex. Yeah, take your time. Yes, I, know. I got blank. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the first one, and then if yeah. the second one comes comes back. Um, I mean, there's so many, but I would say, you know, it's not, I think that, that um, it would definitely be their method rather than, you know, than, than anything specific that they said. And I mean, I wouldn't say they're, the, they're definitely not the only ones to say that, but as of, you know, they've, they, they speak in a language that's very amenable to academic, academic history now. I mean, you know, until recently, they spoke in a language that would get you fired from academic history jobs. So it's not, you know, that's, but, but I think that's, they, they, and I think, for me, I think it, the most important thing is, um, 
I, would, I wouldn't say, they would say working class agency, but I would say plebeian ordinary, the way that ordinary people make history by fighting against their oppressors and that that is really what generate, you know, it's sometimes historians talk about from the bottom up. I don't like the spatial metaphor because I don't think like, you know, ordinary people are at the bottom, but you know, but, but I, think, I think that's really what's important that it's, it's not, you can, it's not that people didn't study what's called social history before, but it's, you know, it's um, understanding ordinary people, not just as people with, you know, curious ways and customs of surviving, but actually they're the ones who make history. Um, and that I think is really cool and inspiring. And I think that for me, that's the most, most important part, more important than anything about like political economy or capitalism or anything else. Thank you for the presentation and the book. Uh, look forward to reading it. Um, I was wondering, um, on the question of slavery, and especially when you mentioned um, self-emancipation, uh, you know, within uh, Marx's lifetime, um, he's uh, witnessed and lived through, or, or, or you know, must have been engaged with the question of slavery in Haiti. Yeah. And I'm wondering, does the Haitian Revolution play a role in his thinking about slavery in the United States and the and the struggle there, um, especially in the correspondences that you trace, not in the kind of formal works that we all know more about. Yeah, it's, you know, I would have expected that too, and I don't see him bringing up, bringing up Haiti. And I think the way Haiti comes up in white writings about slavery is, and actually in Du Bois's Black Reconstruction too, so not only white writings, but in, it's, it's, like emancipation that is too violent. Um, that's not the way African Americans write about Haiti at all. If you read like David Walker, who's a black anti-slavery activist, or um, you know less well-known people writing about Haiti in the in the press, it's like this is you know it's this is like the you know just like European military thinkers were trying to figure out how to repeat Napoleon's successes, African American military thinkers were like, how are we going to repeat the successes of the Haitian Revolution? But Haiti signified like too far, too violent um, to a lot of white writers, and that may be why Marx and Engels didn't didn't write about it, which is interesting. I don't know for sure. They don't they don't they don't mention it at all. But that's you know a lot of times it will come up, including among the abolitionists. Like we should end slavery in the United States by legal means because otherwise we're going to have a Haiti. Um, so it was sort of it, it functioned it functioned that way um, in in white in white discourse, and I mean that's another example. If if that's correct, if my guess is correct about why Marx and Engels didn't mention it. Um, yeah, I would say that's a, another area to challenge them on, for sure. A uh, couple of questions. You mentioned something about um, the revolution in 1840. Yeah. Uh, what was that? And then, um, I, I don't know much about Marx and Engels, uh, Engels yeah. personal um, yeah. history. Yeah. Uh, did they live uh, close by or together in London and then they were separated in when Marx came to America or yeah. what? Yeah. Um, and lastly, uh, what about their thoughts on democracy like uh, he says that um, he doesn't believe in bourgeois democracy. Yeah. He would rather have, um, or they said, yeah. they would rather have a proletarian, um, uh, um, proletarian dictatorship. Yeah. Mm. So uh, what did he mean by pro yeah. dictatorship of proletariat? Yeah. And what about if he didn't like uh, bourgeois democracy, what kind of democracy or election system did he yeah. give any thought about those things? Yeah, definitely. Those are such big questions, so I won't try to give like a, I'll just give my, my, my quick take on all three of those, and the other people who know about that might think have a, have a different take, take on it too, but the way I would, um, the easy one, Marx, Marx um, never went to the United States. It's interesting. If he'd had less money, he would have had to go to the United States, and, it would have been, and then he surely would have ended up fighting in the Civil War. That would have been, that would have been interesting. Um, and um, the, uh, but Marx and Engels were, were close. Then Engels lived in Manchester, and Marx lived in London for the rest of their lives, basically. They, I mean, they traveled some, too. But, um, and um, 
1848 revolutions are so complicated, but the really, it's, they were European-wide revolutions. They were, they started as national revolutions, like liberating the people from monarchic despotism. And during the revolution, class conflict emerged. And suddenly, you know, the people discovered that, like, there were socialists who wanted socialism, and there were bourgeois who wanted pri unrestricted private property. And so they ended up fighting against each other. And that was kind of a key, a key turn um, there. And that's, 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 I think, really where Marx is thinking on the Civil War um, was a response to those, to the, to the failure of those revolutions to become, to succeed and to become communist, um, or to succeed in, 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 in establishing socialism, or even succeeding at all. Um, I would say at this point, um, Marx and most communists, be all communists, believe in universal suffrage as a way to, as, as key, not as, not as enough, but in, in universal suffrage. And when they talk about dictatorship, it's a temporary moment where you have a dictator, like a despot, like Marx talks in the manifesto about despotic inroads into private property. You know, if you're going to change the order of private property, you've got to seize, um, seize property, and you've got to, you know, seize someone's property and then socialize it. Um, in the German press in the Civil War, they, t they call for um, terror um, sometimes against slavery. And what they mean by that, it's interesting because it sounds, we think of the terror in the French, you know, it's, it's the kind of the sort of a right inter misinterpretation of the terror that they're not calling for guillotines to be set up. They're calling for radical social transformations, specifically just ending slavery rather than having compensated emancipation or figuring out loopholes in the Constitution or whatever, just saying like, yeah, forget the law, we're just going to have terror. And that's what, it's, it sounds strange because they, what do they want? But that's what terror means, um, is, you know, is rule, is rule. So that would be um, a, di uh, a, a dictatorship. But yeah, most socialist strategy um, and communist strategy involved suffrage as well, but, the, but also these moments of despotic inroads. And I know that's a huge topic, so there's probably people who also know Marx who are like, have other views too, and those are, you know, get three Marxists in the room and you have four opinions. And, yeah, so, but that's those are my those are my that's my view of the of the of the, of the, of the questions. That's a beautiful way to end. Oh, people join me in thanking Professor Zimmerman. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for your questions. And please do, uh, if you haven't already, purchase a copy of the book from International Publishers. Get a signature, and uh, hope to see you back at the People's Forum tomorrow. I should say there's a convening here beginning at 7 p.m on militarism and the war economy uh, by the Cairo Center Union Theological Seminary. They're going to bring together experts, grassroots organizers, to talk about how to confront um, US uh, militarism. So hope to see you there. You can also find out our events on our website. Um, OK, thanks again for coming out. That was great. Yeah.